All right, well, I've already <clears throat> read the text, so I'm going to just go ahead and start um, last week again, just by way of review. We consider two things about the Sabbath. Uh, again, by Sabbath, I mean um, the, the day which the Lord sets aside and designates to be the day of rest and the day of worship in which we are to gather together and worship Him. So when we think Sabbath, we shouldn't think Saturday, but we should think Sunday, the first day of the week, the day that Jesus entered into His rest, we should think the Lord's Day. Now, um, the first, th well, first of the two things we considered last week is to make sure that we are careful not to react negatively uh, to this day, uh, rather than looking at it as a day of do's and don'ts. You know, we, we don't get to do this, we don't get to do that. We do need to see it as a blessing because the Lord has given it to us as a blessing. Uh, not only do we not have to feel guilty about taking a day off, I mean, that, that's great, you know, to get some rest, uh, we get to spend the whole day with those that we love the most. Okay, and again, that you, if you were following in the, uh, uh, in the prayer, you might have caught on to that. We get to spend the day with, with God. Okay, with our Heavenly Father, uh, with His Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, with the Holy Spirit, and we get to spend the day with each other. Now again, think about how Jesus looked at the Sabbath day. Did, did He you know, look at it and say, Drat, you know, I, I don't get to do the things I really like to do on this day. No, He said, I get to do the things that I really like to do on this day, which is spend time with my Father. And so Jesus delighted in it, and we should as well. Secondly, we saw that in order to keep this day, in order to set it aside to spend time with God, that obviously there are things that we have to set aside so that we'll have time to do it. Uh, the first thing that we saw was we need to set aside our work. Exodus 20, remember, and we've read several times, but the Lord says in it, that is, in the Sabbath day, you shall not do any work. Now, that includes our, our vocations, our employment, uh, housework, yard work, shopping, all the things, you know, we love to do. Uh, we have to set those things aside so we can spend time with Him. God gives us six other days to do that and to get it all done. But this day, He says, don't do any work. Now, He also says, not only are we not to work, but we're also not to make other people work for us. Uh, again, there are exceptions. We don't have time to re rehearse everything that we saw before. Sometimes people need to work to help us if we happen to be traveling or in order to keep things going that sort of preserve the things that we have or make the hospitals run and all that type of thing. But generally speaking, if we don't have to make somebody else work, we shouldn't make them work. Again, the Lord says <clears throat> in Exodus 20, you shall not do any work you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. By the way, that would be a comprehensive list of everything and everyone that you might possibly make work in these days. So we stop working. We also let others uh, take that day off. If we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, then if we're not to work, we shouldn't make them work either. But allow them to rest as we are to rest so that they can do what they're supposed to do, which is what we're supposed to do. Worship God. And we need to do that even if they don't, okay? They're, they're supposed to, you know, on the day of judgment. Those that are unbelievers are going to have to answer for all of their crimes against God. And one of those crimes is going to be all the times they were working or playing or doing something else when they should have been worshiping the Lord, I'm talking about unbelievers, okay? Unbelievers will have to answer for those things. So we don't want to be responsible for making them work and increasing their judgment on that day. Now, finally, we did see that there are exceptions to this rule of work. Um, and I, I get, okay, so here is, we're going to review this just momentarily. A brothel put them into three categories. Religious work, I mean, I'm working and not breaking the Sabbath, but any gospel work can be done on this day of promoting His worship and extending His kingdom through evangelism or you know, a variety of ways to communicate His truth. 
work that is absolutely necessary, which I've already talked about. Sometimes people are serving us because they need to serve us when we're, when we're traveling, uh, which you know, not to do would threaten someone's life or perhaps their property, and works of mercy, helping those who are in need. And really, all of these could be seen as works of mercy. When you do a work of necessity, it's, it is a merciful thing to do. Now, so the first thing we set aside is work. The second thing, we're touching perhaps even maybe a more tender spot, uh, stepping on a sore toe perhaps or touching a nerve uh, because this is something that is very difficult for us to give up on the weekend, okay? The second thing is that we are to set aside is recreation, but not all recreation, but the kinds that we probably enjoy the most, you know, I suppose, worldly recreation, okay? The things that we get engrossed in, uh, such as sports and things like that. Now, why? Well, again, this is implied in keeping the day holy, okay? If we're to give the whole day to God, how can we take a portion of that time and spend it doing something else in which we're not thinking about God? That would be to really thwart the whole purpose of the day, the day is what we are to keep holy, the, the 24 hours of the day, and that means we are to give it wholly to Him. Now, that's implied in what it means, remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, to set it apart, to give it entirely to God because the day belongs to Him. But what is implied there is actually spelled out in our passage this morning. So that's what I want us to look at. He tells us in this passage that there are things we need to set aside besides our work. Now, what he's doing here, you'll probably notice the ifs that are in here. If you do this, if you do that, if you do this, then I will do this. Okay, the Lord is giving to us a series of conditions, things we need to do or not to do that will lead to a conclusion, which is blessing. Now, again, this applies as much today as it did back then. Now, the first condition is this in verse 13 of Isaiah 58. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day. Okay, that's the first condition. Okay. And by the way, in the same, in the same verse, he also talks about um, keeping, um, desisting from your own ways. And I think we should probably put both of those ideas together. Now, what does that mean? Your own pleasure, your own ways. Well, E.J. Young, who was a professor of Old Testament at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia in the last century, who is now with the Lord, uh, wrote this in his commentary on the book of Isaiah. He says, Isaiah evidently intends the first clause to be understood figuratively. To cause to turn one's foot from the Sabbath seems to imply that the Sabbath is a place upon which one walks. Possibly the thought is that the Sabbath is holy ground, and therefore the unsanctified foot is not to walk upon it, which would be a figurative way of saying that one is not to profane the holy day. Or it may be that there is present the idea of treading down or suppressing the Sabbath. The two ideas are not far removed, and the basic thought is that of refraining from desecrating the day, that is, from doing your own pleasure. Your pleasure is that which pleases man instead of God. It is the pleasure of man in contrast to that of God that is brought to the fore. He is in vain against a false observance of the Sabbath as well as against a neglect thereof. The reason for this commandment is that the day belongs to God and is holy. At the creation, he set it apart and sanctified it. And therefore, it is to be observed only in the manner pleasing him. I hope you can see that that seems to be the obvious meaning of it is, you know, we're not supposed to be doing what we want to do, but rather what pleases God. Now, that's something we should be doing all the time throughout the week but we do understand that there, God gives us liberty to do certain things during the week that we wouldn't necessarily have the liberty to do on this day because this day we are to spend with Him. Now, when He says we have to put away everything that pleases us, we need to remember that is not absolute as believers. It certainly pleases us to spend time with Him. 
you know, and we don't have to set that aside. That's what he commands us to do. So what he's talking about here are things we might like to do, but which aren't appropriate on this particular day as they would be on other days. And again, Dr. Young writes this, the, the way is a course of conduct and refers to all courses and actions that men choose in preference to the commands of God. These courses and actions may be right and legitimate on other days, but when they obtrude in the place of that delight, which is to find expression in the observance of the Sabbath, they are to be refrained from. Uh, I hope you can see there when they, that what he says here, when they obtrude in the place of that delight, that is when they take the place of our delighting in God, when they begin to take basically the, the thing or the devotion that is meant for Him, then it becomes really idolatry, doesn't it? Uh, we are to love God most of all. We can't put anything ahead of Him. Now, what are some of these pleasures? What are some of these ways that, um, that we're supposed to set aside? Well, you know, it really depends on each one of us because they're going to be different for each one of us. You know, for some of us, it might be watching movies. You know, maybe we enjoy watching movies. Well, we can't watch movies with some exceptions um, and worship the Lord. We're going to look at some exceptions in a little bit. For others, it might be sports. Perhaps for the vast majority of us, it's sports. Remember last Sunday was the Super Bowl, you know. Uh, there were many believers that were watching the Super Bowl. But should they have been? Or should they have been spending the time with God? Others, it's playing board games. Or others, maybe doing video games. Or others, maybe going to amusement parks or zoos or whatever it may be. And maybe zoos aren't so bad. Now, there's nothing wrong with these things in and of themselves, okay? As long as we don't get addicted to them and become obsessed with them. We know some of these things can be obsessive or, you know, obsessions for people. But to do them on the day the Lord calls us to spend with Him would be wrong because we can't really do both. Now, we might think, well, I can do both. I can worship in the morning and then I can go play my sports in the afternoon. But not if the whole day is to be given to Him. See, remember, it's not remember the Sabbath hour to keep it holy, but remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I mean, have you ever tried uh, to just have a, a conversation with someone uh, that's relational, okay? And while you're talking to them, they're maybe paying attention to something else. Maybe they're on their phone, you know, they're texting or playing a game. Maybe they, they take a phone call in the middle of your conversation and you know, how does that make you feel when they're not focusing on you, when you, you know, are trying to focus on that relationship? Well, I think, I, I'm my own experience, it, it makes you feel slighted, like that person doesn't really care about you. And see, we don't want God to be slighted. We don't want Him to feel that way. God wants our full attention. And that's what we should want to give to Him, of course, if, if we love Him. And that's why we need to set these other things aside. Now, the second condition is that we look at this day as, as a blessing and not as a burden. He says in verse 13, if you call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, okay, uh, you need to see it, we need to see it as a day that we want to spend with, with Him. Now, again, <clears throat> how do you feel when you're with somebody and that person looks and acts, probably like my former example, like they really don't want to be with you. You know, they, they'd rather be doing something else than spending time with you. Well, that doesn't make God happy either. You know, we should be excited about spending time with Him. We should look forward to that. That's what He desires of us. So, again, the, the first condition is we set aside other things that maybe give us pleasure so we can take our pleasure in Him. The second thing, of course, is that we uh, look forward to that day, look forward to that time with Him. And then the third condition is that we actually do spend that time with Him. We actually do honor the Sabbath. He says, if you honor it. And again, Dr. Young writes this, the designation that Israel is to give to the Lord's holy day is to be honored. Israel is thus <clears throat> to regard the day as honorable, and to be treated as honorable. 
Merely to acknowledge the Sabbath as a delight and honorable, however, is not enough. <clears throat> the acknowledgement must be translated into action, and the Sabbath must receive the honor it deserves. By the way, we're not honoring a day, the Sabbath. We're honoring God, okay, by setting that day aside to spend with Him. But then he adds one more thing that we often don't think about, and again, as we get more deeply into this, I hope we understand what he's saying in verse 13, and speaking your own word, okay? That's something else, he says, that we need to desist from. Now, he not only wants us to stop working and playing, so to speak, but he also doesn't want us talking about these things because it can circumvent the reason that he actually gave us the day, right? Now, E.J. Young, again, sees this as idle and vain talk in which God is forgotten or ignored. What is mentioned tends to draw the heart away from God to the consideration of one's own occupations, okay? Now, we could apply this not only, again, to what we say, but we can also apply it to what we think and what we desire. Okay, now think about this. If we shouldn't work on this day, should we be thinking about it? Should we think, be thinking about work? Should we be talking about work? If we shouldn't be engaged in certain recreations, uh, should we be you know, thinking about these things in our minds, speaking about them? Should we be desiring them in our hearts? You realize all these things are just distractions, right? That keep us from focusing on what we're supposed to be focusing on, which is God. Now, the reason I say this is not only because it's, it's actually in the text here, but Jesus, remember, points out in the Sermon on the Mount that the commandments, the Ten Commandments, not only tell us not to do certain things, but also not to think certain thoughts and to have certain desires in our hearts. If it's wrong to murder, it's also wrong to hate or to want to murder somebody in our hearts or think about murdering them. Uh, if it's wrong to commit adultery, it's wrong to imagine committing adultery. It's wrong to want to commit adultery. It's wrong to lust. Well, the same thing is true with regard to the things we shouldn't be doing uh, on the Sabbath. Okay, so this is, again, the rule. But there are exceptions to the rule, just as there are in exceptions to work. The, uh, there are activities that can draw our hearts and our minds away from the Lord, but there are also those that can draw us closer, okay? Such as, and this, these are recreations, uh, going outside maybe to the mountains or to the deserts or to the beaches, although you have to be careful if you go to the beach, um, to get outdoors, right? Uh, to see the beauty that God has made, to see His glory. I mean, go out at night in the mountains, look at the starry sky. You don't see just a few little sparkles there, but you see this huge clusters of stars, and when you see those things, it makes you think about the power and the wisdom of God. Really, you can't look anywhere and, and not see it, according to Paul. You know, that God has clearly revealed Himself through His creation. Now, doing that can be very restful, and it can be worshipful, and I don't think the Lord is telling us not to do that. We can get together with brothers and sisters, even outside of church, for fellowship, and encourage each other in the Lord. Certainly, we can read good Christian biographies. Those are perhaps some of the most encouraging things we can read. When we read what takes place in the Bible, sometimes we think, well, those people weren't real. I mean, they were real, but we can sometimes think they weren't real. But when we see somebody outside of the Scripture living the kind of life that God calls us to live, somebody just like us, even though these people are just like us, okay, it somehow is encourages us that, hey, if they can do this, if they can seek the Lord in this way, if they can serve Him in this way, maybe we can too. So this, that's very encouraging. We can read books that help us understand God, uh, Knowing God by J.I. Packer, or What Pleases God. Read the Puritans if you want to really learn about these things. We have plenty of good literature in that library back there. I'm not sure what the turnover is on those books, but there's lots of good books back there, and I just recommend that you get in there and read some of those. The Lord's Day is a day you can do that. Uh, we can also watch certain things. There's plenty of great 
church documentaries, I should say documentaries on church history, movies that have been made about characters that, that we really appreciate, which I wish they'd make more of, but movies like Amazing Grace, you know, William Wilberforce and, and the abolition of slavery, or Cromwell, the English Civil War, fought on biblical principles, God's Outlaw, the translation of the Bible into English, uh, Wycliffe, basically the same thing, Luther, as you know, the Protestant Reformation, Chariots of Fire, which has to do with Eric Little and his commitment to keep the Sabbath. You know, he was in the Olympics, and he refused to run on the Sabbath. And the reason is because he comes from the same background as this church, Scottish Presbyterian, had the same confession that we have, the same belief system, and he spent the day with God rather than, you know, in worship and fellowship, rather than even going out and seeing what his teammates were doing during the Olympics, okay, because of his commitment and, of course, Pilgrim's Progress, and, and there are others. So there, those are things we can do. There's plenty of Ligonier videos and audio lectures, sermons you can take advantage of throughout the week, but especially on the Lord's Day. We can take a nap. Okay, it's supposed to be a day of rest, as long as we don't spend the whole day sleeping, you know. Or we can even get some exercise, and by that I mean perhaps uh, some walking or running if we need it in order to stay awake so that we can worship the Lord. But public worship should be basically our priority. That should be the most important thing, which is why we have two services on the Lord's Day so that we can basically make the best use of this day, and then we can use these other activities to sort of fill in uh, the rest of the day. You know, if, if you even just come to both services, you find that oftentimes that takes a large portion of the day uh, and uses it in a very good way, if, if you're able to, okay? Now, there are also exceptions with regard to what we talk about, and we have to be, again, uh, open to that. You know, we don't want to focus on our work and tell everybody what, maybe what the things are we're doing just because we want to talk about our work. But if we're struggling in our employment, if we're faced with, with moral decisions, you know, in our employment, I think it's perfectly okay to talk about those things and to get help, to get counsel, to get encouragement. I think it's a work of mercy for us to be able to help one another uh, solve those types of issues. Uh, we might also talk about sports or movies, but only if it really are, if we're drawing examples, spiritual examples or lessons from them, maybe to encourage each other. Uh, you know, we just need to be careful we don't go too far and begin talking about these things merely for the pleasure of doing it at the expense of focusing on God, because our, really our whole purpose on this day is to help each other do exactly that. Uh, the Sabbath is a picture of heaven. It's to remind us where we're going. It reminds us what life is really all about. Paul writes in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Now, if that's supposed to be the course, you know, the way we conduct our entire lives, how much more should we do this on the Lord's Day? So doing the things that the Lord tells us to do and not doing the things He tells us not to do will help us stay focused on this day and remind us of where we're going. And I think it will also help us stay focused on the other six days that uh, we have to work, to make sure that we are working not for the weekend, you know, uh, not working for retirement when we get to have do all the fun things we wanted to do, but we're working for our ultimate retirement, uh, which is in heaven. Now, lastly, let me just say this. The Lord tells us in verse 14 that if we do these things, if we don't seek our pleasure but His, if we really delight in His day, love this day, look forward to this day, if we don't, on this day, dwell on the things that are on, on earth, just purely for the pleasure of doing that, but on Him and His kingdom, He says it will lead to an even greater spiritual blessing. You know, the first thing He says is it will show us something about ourselves. It will give us assurance, OK? 
Okay? That's why I say it's a spiritual thermometer. Verse 14. Okay, if these things, if you will do these things, he says in verse 14, then you will take delight in the Lord. Now, there's a verb in here that can be translated in various ways because of its tense, and here it's translated as a future, and it doesn't seem to make any sense. It can also be translated as a present. Then you really do delight in the Lord. I think that's what he's telling us here. You know, not that you will, but you do. If these things are true of you, then you really do love Him. You know, Jesus said the same thing to His disciples um, about keeping His commandments, didn't He? In John 14, 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And what the Lord is saying through Isaiah here is, is if you keep the fourth commandment, you really do love me. Okay, secondly, He says... He will strengthen us, and that's what's behind this, this next clause. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. Okay, that, that sounds rather strange to us, but what it means is I will give you victory in your warfare. And, of course, we're involved in spiritual warfare on earth. And whether we realize it or not, the enemy is attacking us and trying to take us down. Okay, but if we keep the Sabbath, God will give us the strength to overcome it because he will support us. Think about what the prophet Hanani said to Asa, the king of Judah. I think perhaps one of my favorite verses in the Bible. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Now, the Lord knows those who are his, but what do you think the Lord looks for when he's searching the earth? Well, one of the things he looks for is what we're doing on this day. Are we actually spending it with him? Are we worshiping him? Or are we just doing the things that the world's do, you know, the people of the world do? So if he sees that we are keeping his Sabbaths, he will be a support to us. And thirdly, he will give us all the resources that come from Jesus, that Jesus has purchased for us. And I think that's what's referred to in this last clause, uh, or the second to the last. And I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. That, that sounds, again, somewhat ambiguous. But we need to remember that Jacob was an heir of the Abrahamic promise. God had promised to Abraham that through his seed all the nations would be blessed. Um, basically, what God promised to Abraham, which was passed down to Isaac and then to Jacob, were all the promises and blessings of, of the new covenant. So what he's saying here is he would feed us not, not only with redemption, as it were, through the promised Messiah, but everything that comes through Jesus Christ, everything that comes through faith in him, to give us the strength and to encourage us. And we talk about all these different things that we do on the Lord's Day as a means to support us. Well, obedience is another one. When the Lord sees that we're obeying him, he gives us a greater strength through His Son, the Lord Jesus, which is, I believe, what's referred to. And then finally, He ends with His personal guarantee. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And you know, God never lies when He says something. He's absolutely serious. Now, we do not earn these blessings by keeping the Sabbath. Remember, we, you know, that, that would be legalism, wouldn't it? If we say, I'm saved because I keep the commandments and... Uh, God's going to, you know, he, he loves me because I keep the commandments. No. But by keeping the commandments, we actually show that we already belong to him. You know, just like the, remember on the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers. Not, you know, um, again, blessed are the peacemakers for they will inherit the earth. Do you become a peacemaker so that you can inherit the earth? Or are you made a peacemaker by the grace of God and that shows that you will inherit the earth? You see, that's how we need to understand the Beatitudes and that's how we need to understand this. We don't bring these blessings down by keeping the Sabbath, but by keeping the Sabbath, we show that these things really already belong to us. And I think we receive a greater measure of this blessing when we spend more time with the Lord. And that's really where the blessings come from. It's not, again, I do this. <coughs> Excuse me. Feel that tickle coming on. <coughs> I 
let's not think of it as I do this to get this, but I do this to please the Lord, and He blesses me with more, okay? So that is how the Sabbath day is a blessing, and how it becomes a blessing to us, and how it shouldn't really be a burden to us. Now, again, I, I realize that this has stepped on all of our toes. It stepped on my toes as well, okay? So we just need to think about these things, and if we see that this really is what the Lord intends, and if we haven't been doing things exactly the way that we should be, then we, we, we just really need to bring those things, put them away really, and, and bring things into, con, into conformity with what God desires. And, and let me just, I don't, I don't know if any one of us here would disagree that if we actually did keep the Sabbath the way that, again, we've, we've been looking at, that we're not going to come away the better for it. This, you know, the more time we spend with God, the more blessed we're going to be. And if we're not spending that time with Him, it may explain why we struggle the rest of the week and why we're not seeing the kind of power we might hope to have in our lives um, to serve Him. Now, we do have one more sermon on the Sabbath, and it steps on more toes, you know, that's kind of the way it, it works, but that's good, right? Remember what King David said about um, his, the people he wanted to surround him with himself with were basically, he wanted righteous people. He didn't want ear, you know, people who would tickle his ears. He certainly didn't want, you know, people who wanted to destroy him. But he wanted righteous people to surround him. And why? It's because when he did something wrong, they would call him to account. And so he says in one of the Psalms, let the righteous smite me on the head. It's like oil upon the head. Let them smite me in kindness. Uh, sometimes it feels like we're kind of getting struck, you know, when God's Word comes home and uh, we feel convicted by it. But we need to remember that that too is for our good because unless we actually see what it is that we're doing that's displeasing to Him, we're never actually going to bring our lives back into, you know, alignment with what it is that God wants us to do. So tonight we're going to complete this series by considering how to keep the Sabbath holy by not adding other days or taking away from the day by adding things to the day, other things we can add to the day that can really take away from the day, okay? So if that makes sense. And we'll kind of wrap it all up. So anyway, I uh, hope you'll be able to make it this evening. But let, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And as we pray, <clears throat> let's think about what this tells us we ought to be doing, what, what we might need to change. That's what repentance is, turning from what I was doing that was wrong and beginning to do what I should be doing, which is right. And particularly as we come to the table, uh, remembering that um, uh, the Lord treats this as particularly holy, and we need to treat it as, um, you know, very seriously, because um, as in other things, but I think even more so here, the Lord says He will discipline us if, if we don't... Uh, well, if we don't treat this with respect and uh, treat it reverently. So let's, let's bow and let's ask the Lord to prepare us for the table.